You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello everyone and welcome to the History of the Great War episode 192 to Kill an Empire. A big thank you goes out this week to Dr. Thomas for his support of the podcast on Patreon. Over on Patreon, uh, members get access to special Patreon-only episodes, like the recent two uh, members' episodes that talk about conscription in the British Empire, with a special emphasis on the attempts of the British in 1918 to extend conscription to Ireland. If that's something that sounds interesting to you, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to check it out. Over the last several episodes, we have looked at the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire, mostly due to the actions of the Allies in Paris and London, both during and after the war. This episode marks a shift in our focus to the fate of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Eastern Europe. Today we will discuss the fate of Austria and Hungary, who previously made up the two pieces of the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. The next episode, we will take a look at the creation of Yugoslavia, then after that we will discuss Czechoslovakia and some of the other Eastern European countries, and then in the fourth episode we will discuss the fate of Poland. All of these topics are very difficult to pry apart into a nice cohesive story, so I will often be referring to all of these countries in each episode. Their fates were tied very closely together because of the primary question that they would ask at the Paris Peace Conference, which would be borders. Unlike the new nations in the Middle East, which were created by the declarations from Paris, in Eastern Europe the countries created themselves, often along ethnic lines. Then when they came to Paris for the conference, they came to have their new countries recognized. With so many different groups next to each other creating new countries, there was bound to be disagreements. Borders were a problem, especially when multiple ethnic groups mingled together. These problems would create many arguments, some of which the Allies in Paris would help resolve, some of which would result in armed conflict. In both cases, the Supreme Council found that its power of decree was not as strong as initially thought, and often the countries in Eastern Europe would be able to choose their own fate, or be victims of their neighbors. While those are the themes of all four of these Eastern European episodes, today we'll be looking at two pieces of the former empire, Austria and Hungary. Both of these new countries would have to come to terms with a greatly reduced geographical footprint and internal struggles due to the strain of four years of war. The results of these internal struggles would be drastically different in the two countries. When I titled this episode To Kill an Empire, I wasn't actually referring to the actions of the Paris Peace Conference, or the Allies. In fact, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was already dead by the time that the war was over. During the last few weeks of the war, Emperor Karl would realize that Vienna was powerless to stop the various nationalities of the empire from declaring independence. These declarations had started with the Poles on October 15th, then the Ruthenes on the 19th, and the Czechs and the Hungarians on the 28th, and the Slavs on the 29th. With the empire falling apart around him, Emperor Karl, while never formally abdicating his rights as emperor, relinquished control of the government and army, essentially destroying the old empire. The future Austrian territories then created their own government for what was left under their control. All of these events, while welcomed by the Allies, brought up some very important questions after the armistice was signed. Who would the Allies negotiate with? 
what representatives of Austro of the Austro-Hungarian Empire would be sent to Paris, which areas would be recognized as independent of that empire. As the peace conference got underway and the basic structure of the peace agreements began to take form, other questions also had to be answered. Most importantly, who was going to pay Austria-Hungary's share of war reparations? While these questions did not have an easy answer, as obvious targets of Allied anger, the new governments of both Austria and Hungary appealed for mercy. They claimed that they were no longer the same country that had entered the war in 1914. They were new countries, under new leadership, and therefore could not be blamed for the mistakes of the old empire. While both countries made this same argument, the situation within both countries meant that their situations, and therefore how they were treated in Paris, were very different. Austria, while a mere fraction of its former size, would at least be at peace, while Hungary found itself at war with most of its neighbors. These differences caused very different political outcomes as well. In Austria, a socialist government would come to power and mostly stay in power for the post-war period. In Hungary, they would quickly find themselves in the middle of, the Bol of a Bolshevik revolution and then subject to foreign invasions. One of the problems that the Supreme Council and the Paris Peace Conference as a whole had when trying to handle situations like what was happening in Eastern Europe is that there was not a great way to get really good solid information about what was going on, you know, thousands of miles away. This was true for the former Austro-Hungarian Empire in the same way that it had been for the Middle East. Good information was just very hard to come by, and when it did arrive it was often discounted due to the general quality of the other information that arrived. There were times when good information did arrive, and it was believed like the information that arrived in early 1919 about the situation in Austria. We discussed this a bit back in earlier episodes, but life was very challenging in Austria after about uh, 1916. One report that arrived in Paris stated that there was almost no livestock, in Vienna there was basically no food, and hundreds of thousands of people were unemployed. A British representative, a William Beveridge, was sent to Vienna in January 1919 to try and find the truth of the situation. He reported that if immediate relief did not arrive soon, the society would completely collapse. This and other reports caused the Allies to lift their blockade of Austria, which up to that point was still ongoing since the war had ended. They also offered credit to the new Austrian government, which they could use to buy foreign goods. Eventually, Austria would actually become the fourth largest beneficiary of Allied aid, behind only Germany, Poland, and Belgium. At the conference, the Austrian delegation would be led by the country's new prime minister, Karl Renner. He would arrive and then be forced to wait, as the Supreme Council had not completely decided on the terms that would be given to Austria. They were dealing with some of the same problems with Austria that I mentioned earlier. At the top of the list was how much this new country would be held accountable for the mistakes of the empire. Wilson was particularly concerned about how it would look if Austria, a country mostly founded upon the principles of Wilson's 14 points, was punished for the mistakes of its uh, previous empire. The, the Supreme Council did not see any easy answers to these questions. Fortunately, they did have one question in front of them that they unequivocally knew the answer to. After the war, the new country of Austria was made up of the areas of the empire that were predominantly German. Uh, this caused many Austrians to believe that the best path forward for the country was to join with Germany. This was based on many reasons, not least of which was concerns with so much volatility surrounding the small country that it would actually not survive unless it joined with Germany, who was obviously much larger. The new Austrian government even opened negotiations with the government in Berlin to see how they could join the country. Now, the Austrians were not prepared to just jump into Germany. They wanted to make sure that the specific Austrian character was not lost in the transition, but they were definitely ready to go. There was also some resistance in Austria due to the long rivalry between the Prussians and Austrians, but this was always in the minority. The bigger roadblock was actually the Germans. They were very cautious about the suggestion because they did not want to anger anybody in Paris because they were still working on the German terms for the treaty. When the Allies learned that discussions were happening between the Germans and Austrians, they moved in quickly to stop them. France was adamant that the two countries should not be joined together. That would completely destroy their entire plan to keep Germany as weak as possible. Adding Austria to Germany would just make the Germans stronger for the next war, and nobody wanted that. 
While the question of whether or not Austria could join with Germany was quickly answered by the Allies, the exact peace terms for Austria were never high on the priorities list for the Supreme Council, and Austria would have to wait until the terms with Germany were worked out. It would not be until the end of May that the Austrian delegation would very politely complain to the Council, wondering where their terms were, and it would not be until June the 2nd that they would receive them. By all accounts, the document that was provided, and this is a word that one of the delegates would use, was very slapdash. This was because the Allies had mostly just taken the German treaty and then edited it to fit with Austria. In general, they would go easier on the small country. They removed most of the text that had to do with war guilt, since, as Lloyd George pointed out, Emperor Karl had not been on the throne in 1914, let alone the current Austrian government. On the sticky topic of reparations, they put most of the requirements to pay them on Austria and Hungary, and they also added on top of this the Austro-Hungarian war debt. When the Austrians received these terms, they immediately went to work on a reply. They did not even address some of the clauses, for example reparations and war debt, because they simply believed that they would never be able to pay it anyway, so why would it matter? They instead focused on some very small and specific clauses that they wanted added into the treaty to try and protect their new country. These were generally very small in the eyes of the Allies, for example an amendment to make sure that Austria's art treasures could not be divided up among the Empire's various successor states, but these small things were quite important to the Austrian delegates. Many of these small changes would eventually make it into the treaty, and after it was signed, Austria was finally at peace. But the post-war years would not be easy. The Austrian economy would never fully recover from the war, and as it started to finally come back almost a decade later, it would be hit by the Great Depression. Karl would attempt twice to reclaim the Hungarian crown to add to Austria, but both in the year 1921, and then the Allies eventually decided that he should be cast into exile on Madeira, an island in the North Atlantic. After an uncomfortable 20s, the 30s would not be much better, and then in 1938 Austria would finally unite with Germany in the Anschluss. This would set the Austrians up to once again go to war side by side with the Germans, and somehow it would go even worse the second time. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. While the Austrians were dealing with their own problems, the other side of the dual monarchy, Hungary, was dealing with even larger ones. Hungary was in a rough spot at the end of the war, and it had many things working against it. First, of course, it had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and was seen as one of the enemy states by the Allies. A second, it was not a well-understood country in Western Europe, and its delegation to Paris was less than inspiring. Finally, and much more impactfully, 
It was surrounded by new and old countries that had been formed either out of the old empire or were looking to expand their territory into that of the old empire. This meant that many Hungarians did not expect much out of the peace conference, but they did hope that it would at least limit the damage. Many had come to expect that many areas that the Hung- Hungarians claimed as their own would be leaving, like Croatia and Slovakia. But there was one area that many Hungarians considered to be a step too far, Transylvania. Transylvania had been a part of Hungary since the 11th century, and even though the population of the area was only 23% Hungarian, it was still believed to be a critical piece of the new country, and one that simply could not be taken away. It was also geographically over half of the old kingdom of Hungary. Unfortunately for the Hungarians, it was also coveted by several other countries, most importantly Romania. Basically, the entire reason that Romania had entered the war was to try and get Transylvania added to its territory, and they were not about to let it simply slip away now that the war was over. These were all very big problems, but before they could even be presented and decided on by the Supreme Council, back in Hungary an important event would happen. A Bolshevik government would come to power. After the war, Hungary was led by a government that was very unstable. It was attacked from the right due to its attempts at instituting land reform. It was attacked from the left due to not taking the land reforms far enough. Both sides then also criticized the government for its seeming willingness to trade away pieces of Hungary that both the far left and the far right believed should stay within the country. On February 22nd, uh, protests by communists turned violent, and four policemen were killed. This would lead to almost a month of violence and instability around the country. Then, on March 21st, a Bolshevik by the name of Berakun would proclaim the creation of the Hungarian Soviet Republic. Berakun was originally from Transylvania, and he had joined up with the Austro-Hungarian army when the war began. He would spend some time fighting the Russians before he was captured and sent to a Russian prisoner of war camp. During the Russian Revolution in 1917, Belakun uh, very rapidly changed his political outlook, and by 1918 he was released and meeting with Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders on a somewhat regular basis. He would then return to Hungary in the chaotic post-war days, and he would begin to grow a base of power. He issued manifestos, listed demands, and began to organize strikes and demonstrations. In March, he would declare the creation of the new Soviet Republic without having to fire a shot. In Paris, the news of the change in government arrived and hit the Allied leaders like a lightning bolt. There had always been concerns that Bolshevism would spread to other countries, a fear stoked by the almost constant rhetoric coming from the Bolsheviks themselves that they were at the vanguard of a global revolution. And here was the first seemingly successful example of that global revolution, and it really scared people. With Bolshevism having made the jump into Hungary, in Paris, conversations got very serious very quickly. They decided to send a mission to Budapest, led by Jan Christian Smuts. This mission would have two primary purposes. The first, and definitely least important, was to persuade Bela Kuhn and the Hungarian government to accept some territorial concessions with Romania. If they did not do this, it was likely that a Romanian force led by French General Mangin would move in to take the territory by force. This was also the least important reason for the mission, though. The most important cause for Smuts to go to Budapest is because he wanted to talk to Bela Kuhn to determine if he might be a good person to create a diplomatic back channel with Lenin and the Bolsheviks in Russia. This is a topic that we will dive into in later episodes, but at this point in time, the Allies were trying to start discussions with the Bolsheviks, but for political reasons, they could not just go and talk to them. They hoped that Bela Kuhn could help them out with this problem by providing an easy way for the Allies and the Bolsheviks to talk off the record. When Smuts arrived via train in Budapest, he insisted that Bela Kuhn come to him and that their meetings take place on the train. After Bela Kuhn arrived, after some delay, the discussions did not go well. Bela Kuhn refused out of principle to give in on any of the territorial concessions with Romania, and he also wanted immediate official recognition for his government, recognition that the Allies were simply unwilling to give. After a few brief meetings, Smuts would leave, forming a very negative opinion of the new Hungarian leader, and doubting very seriously that his regime would last very long, making any formal relations with the government unnecessary. 
After Smuts arrived back in Paris and gave his report, many of the other leaders began to also doubt the future of Bella Kuhn's government. And, to be honest, he really wasn't doing anything to help himself stay in power for any length of time. He was certainly trying to make changes. He would be in power for just a bit over 130 days, and during that time he announced drastic reforms. Prohibition of alcohol, socialization of the factories, land reform, abolition of all hereditary titles, reallocation of housing, proletariat culture for all, and that's just a partial list, just the beginning. In enacting so many changes so suddenly, he would rob himself of most of his allies within Hungary. Sure, there were, there were always some Bolsheviks surrounding him that supported these initiatives, but many moderates rapidly left his side. This may or may not have been enough to cause his government to fall, but we will never know. That is because just a few days after Smuts's mission left Hungary, the country would be at war with both Czechoslovakia and Romania, and it would not end well. In April, both the Czechs and the Romanians would launch attacks into Hungarian territory. The Romanians would move through the neutral zone that had been set up in Transylvania, and they would push towards Budapest. The Czechs would do the same from the north. As would so often be the case with the governments created in the chaos of the post-war years, when the foreign armies arrived in the country, Bela Kuhn actually saw his support rapidly increase. He appealed to patriotism, and both fresh volunteers and officers of the old army answered his call. In both cases, the men joining up did not necessarily like Bela Kuhn or agree with his policies. All they knew was that anyone was better than the Romanians. With these new forces, the Hungarian army was able to push back the Czech advance and keep them from linking up with the Romanians. As the fighting continued into late May, in Paris, the Supreme Council decided to step in, and they sent a message to the Romanians that they must not occupy Budapest, and then they sent messages to Bela Kuhn saying that he must stop fighting, to which he replied that he would only stop if the Romanians and the Czechs did it first. In the Supreme Council, they would send another message, this time to Hung Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. This message contained declarations about what the new borders between the countries would be, and in order to withdraw their armies to those borders. This is a fantastic example of the Supreme Council having no real clear idea of what their ability to influence events actually was, because none of the three countries were prepared to agree with the borders that were being sent to them. Romania used the excuse that if they withdrew, it would open them to attack from both Hungary and Bolshevik Russia, and the other countries simply refused. In Paris, there were then discussions about a joint military force that could be sent to occupy Hungary, which would be made up of French, Yugoslavia, and Romanian troops. This force was not sent due to concern that if the Allies let the Romanians occupy all of Hungary, they may never leave. While these discussions were still happening in Hungary, Bela Kuhn would make his last mistake as the leader of Hungary. In July, he would launch an offensive with the goal of pushing the Romanian troops back across the Tisza River, which would provide some breathing room for Budapest. This offensive would be a disaster. And while there were some small initial successes, a Romanian counterattack proved to be devastating. Bela Kuhn was counting on some units from Russia to help his troops, but they would never arrive, and so some Hungarian units simply stopped fighting. The Romanians would enter Budapest in early August. For the next four months, Hungary would be occupied by three of its enemies, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania. The Romanians occupied the largest area, and the capital, and they wasted no time in instituting a policy of official looting. Everything that was not nailed down could be requisitioned, and much of it was. It would not be until November that the Supreme Council would once again attempt to intervene, sending another message to the three occupying countries, telling them that it was time to move to their new borders. This time they would listen, and a new government would finally be formed in Hungary, and this one would officially be invited to Paris to receive the country's peace terms. The delegation was led by Count Albert Alpanier, and he would leave for Paris in early January 1920. Apogne would be a good choice to lead the delegation. He spoke English and Italian perfectly, which allowed him to communicate with the other leaders easily enough. He would plead for mercy. As the treaty was drawn up and the terms were made clear, he would ask why Hungary was being punished more than almost any other country that had joined in the war. 
It would stand to lose two-thirds of its territory, two-thirds of its population. It would be cut off from the sea. It would lose much of its access to raw materials. And along with Austria, it would be saddled with much of the empire's reparation bill. The other leaders in Paris heard the message, but at this point they were unwilling to change anything. Hungary was one of the last pieces of the puzzle to fall into place in Eastern Europe, and none of the other leaders wanted to renegotiate with any of the other parties, and this left them little wiggle room in the terms that they provided. It was due to the concerns of the Hungarians that they would not sign the treaty until June 4, 1920, and on that date flags would fly half-mast throughout the country. The harsh terms fueled resentment towards the Allies. Hungary had certainly got the short end of the stick when it came to their peace terms, In 1919, one English observer had said to the post-war Hungarian leader, Kareli, that the Entente governments had many more important things to worry about than the fate of 10 million people in Hungary. While these words were said in 1919, they would prove to be a pretty accurate estimation of the importance of Hungary to the Allies, and the Hungarians paid the price. Thank you.